Hello everybody and welcome back to Blue Jays Today, where your boys, we always got something to say about the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm your host, Adam Pennell. And I'm your host, Nicholas Playalog. And today, guys, we are joined by a very, very special guest. If you're looking for Blue Jays analysis, this is your freaking guy. Welcome in, Ben Nicholson-Smith. Let's go. Welcome in, Ben. Hey, guys. Thank you for that intro. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be talking with you. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great to have you, dude. Uh, you know, I, we are, uh, I guess we'll out ourselves right here, uh, thorough fans of yours. We love all your work. We love everything you do, man. Pretty much all of your articles we're, uh, we're consistently reading and consuming. So, uh, so yeah, you, you got some fans here at Blue Jays today. Appreciate that. Pretty much all. I like how that leaves a little room for you guys to skim over <laughs> some of the less important ones. But, uh, I appreciate that for sure. No, man. I mean, we've definitely clipped a lot of your tweets as well. So all of our audience, like they know you very well from a ton of our content. So it's good to put uh, the tweets and get the person instead of the tweets. So we're, we're excited to hear your thoughts, man. Yeah, 100 percent. It's uh, it's an interesting time for the Jays and for, for MLB, obviously, with things starting up in a week. So, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, well, we do want to talk, obviously, majority about the Toronto Blue Jays. But um, I mean, I feel like you, we just got to bring this up, dude. Uh, Shohei Otani is currently in the news and, uh, and I mean, he's always in the news, but this isn't necessarily the, the best light, uh, that's, that's going on right now. Um, very complicated stuff. I don't want to break down everything that's happening. Cause even I don't fully understand. And I feel like I'm going to embarrass myself if I try, but, uh, folks, if you're listening or watching this, go read some articles on it. It's a lot. Um, but effectively, if I'm understanding things correctly, uh, his interpreter was, gambling uh, through an illegal source with his money he got himself into a hole Otani gets involved it's a whole mess uh, what are your thoughts on all of this Ben well you know I, I kind of think of it through the lens of what did this had happened when he was on the Toronto Blue Jays right because we know that they were interested obviously there's an alternate universe out there somewhere where Otani ends up with the Jays and I'm just thinking like covering this story would be really tough um this would be an organizational major, major deal uh, because mm. of the importance of Shohei Otani. So everyone in that Dodgers organization right now is probably scrambling to some extent, especially because their regular season has already started. So, yeah, it's pretty massive. Um, obviously not a good look for Major League Baseball. Um, I, I, everyone is saying that Shohei Otani is not involved in the capacity of being a gambler. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, that certainly sounds plausible and passes the, the eye test. But at the same time, to have your biggest star in the sport linked to gambling and gambling debt, it is, it's a tough look. And this is not the way MLB would have wanted to open the season. Yeah, no, and I feel like right now everyone's just trying to figure out what is happening before we make any assumptions because the last thing that baseball needs, especially after this offseason and what he's been doing, winning uh, two MVP awards, that last thing you need to do is have your almost poster boy involved in so this sort of incident. Like, we, we all figured it would be a growth kind of thing. So it's going to be interesting to see how they kind of navigate and, and tread these waters very carefully. Yeah, for sure. I think, you know, you look at the – um the social media reaction to this and a lot of it's like joking and you see like you know commentary and, and people sort of sort of joking around about um you know the betting and baseball possibility and and clear, everyone has said there was no betting in baseball it was on soccer it was on nfl nba but still you just get really close to it right and it's mm -hmm. never a comfortable look obviously baseball has a big history with this with pete rose and it's hard to say that this is going to be the last time it's going to happen because you have so many uh, sports books that are legally, uh, you know, sponsors and in some cases like, you know, close sponsors of Major League Baseball. So it's all very tightly knit and it's uh, it's a pretty murky situation at times. And this is definitely one of them. Yeah, I guess uh, it's probably too early to tell. And, you know, we're still waiting on some information. But, you know, can you speculate at all as to what you think maybe the fallout of this could look like? or how they're going to proceed at least? Well, I think if you're MLB, it probably makes sense to look at this very closely, just given uh, that this is your biggest star in the sport um, and what it could mean for other stars. Um, if you're the Players Association, I think you'd want to be sure that your players have enough support around them and have enough knowledge to arm themselves with uh, the next time something like this comes up. So I would think that both the league and the Players Association have a vested interest in taking a really close look at this. 
Obviously, for the Dodgers, they need to make a new hire. And for Otani, too, like, let's not forget this guy, Ipe Mizuhara, was not just an interpreter. He was a huge part of his life. And so yeah. just from a day-to-day -day standpoint, this guy was maybe his best friend in some ways, certainly the closest person to him on the team. So there is a void there that will have to be filled in some ways as Otani proceeds with his new team. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I can't agree more. And uh, I guess we'll kind of wait and see. You know, that's all we can got to do. Maybe there'll be an investigation soon. We'll have to kind of keep a close eye there. Yeah. Um, I do want to transition a little bit now over towards a, another sort of recent news in Blue Jay land. Uh, you tweeted it out. Santiago Espinal, he has now been sent over to the Cincinnati Reds uh, for Chris McIlvain. I think that's how we pronounce his name. The E keeps throwing me off every time I'm looking for it. Uh, Chris McIlvain over to the Blue Jays. Uh, first, initial reactions um, and what, uh, you know, what, what do you think is uh, why they did that? I think we all have kind of ideas to make up roster space, like to find the roster space. But um, why do you think they, they sent it over for, for Chris? Yeah, interesting move. I mean, this is one that if you look back at some of the articles I wrote in October, I was predicting like, hey, they could trade Espinal for like a prospect in cash, right? Like this was not, this was not a shock to me, at least. Um, I've kind of wondered about this possibility for the last five, six months. And here it is. It happened. I think part of this is connected to Ernie Clement and the fact mm -hmm. that he really pushed for that roster spot. The Jays seem comfortable rolling with him. So great. You already have a utility infielder who's going to be able to fill that role. Then you're not going to need an Espinal on the bench necessarily. Might as well clear the money. They waited until late in spring because you never know. What if Clement pulls a hamstring or what if Boba Shep pulls a hamstring and you need mm -hmm. Espinal? But now we're less than a week away. They have kind of realized they don't need Espinal. So they trade him away, free up some cash, and free up the 40-man spot too, which they're going to need once they place one of their backup catchers onto the 40-man. Right. Well, you uh, like you, you had a great tweet there that I thought was very insightful. You were talking about that catcher, and then you went on to just talk about Voto, uh, or not uh, Voto, Voto, <laughs> excuse me, and, uh, and, and Vogelbach. And you were saying that this might not be the end. You know, there could be another move uh, relatively soon, you know, whether it be a DFA or another trade. Can you expand on that a little bit? And then maybe, you know, if there is potentially a guy or two in mind that that could fit fit that, uh, that spot? Yeah, I, I don't think they're done making moves because right now, so to get a little bit into the minutia of the 40-man roster here, they're at 39 right now. So then you add the backup catcher on, boom, back to 40. Well, what if you want to add Vado or Vogel back? Then you need to create another space to get back down to 39. Mm -hmm. So that's where I say, all right, you're going to have to make some sort of move, whether it is a DFA, releasing someone, trading someone. So I look at the edges of this roster. I'm like, is Hagen Danner a candidate to be a DFA? Is Josfer Zulueta a candidate to be DFA? You know, Nathan Lucas, I think they probably want to keep, um, but they mm -hmm. have designated him before. So, you know, there are a few different ways you can look at this and, and, I just see that in the next week or so, there's probably some other move coming. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Actually, I, I just thought of a question right now. Speaking of Vogelbach and Votto, we had Vogie hit a homer another one the other day. Votto's been dealing with a little bit of a rolled ankle situation on a bat in the dugout. Where are we at right now? Now that we're seven days away, uh, when this podcast comes out, it'll be six days. Where are we at right now in terms of that competition for that last spot? What have you heard in, from Blue Jays camp? Well, they both look really good. And Vogelback, like from really the beginning of spring, he looked great. And he's been nothing but what you'd exactly want him to be in that yeah. role as a master of right-handed pitching. So that's a good start. Now, Joey Votto has also looked great, but the playing time has been so limited. So we're talking about someone who's seen one pitch in spring training. Now he hit it out of the park. It was off Zach Wheeler, off the field. You love to see that if you're the Blue Jays, and that's all good signs. But at the same time, this is isn't someone who's seen enough pitches to just slot into a major league lineup tomorrow. So the next five or six days are going to be really big. If he can get 20 plate appearances, maybe that's enough to go into the season. I mean, he's certainly an established, experienced hitter, um, but he might need more time. And if the ankle needs a couple days, that pushes things back to the point that Votto probably has to start in whatever it is, Class A Dunedin, Extended Spring, Triple A Buffalo, Either way, he starts in the minor leagues, something he's very open to. Or, and in that scenario, maybe you do take Vogel back. And maybe you are, you know, clicking in that $2 million that the Vogel back would make at the major league level, start adding onto the payroll, and that might connect to the Espinal decision to trade him and free up a little bit of money.
Yeah, I mean, well, it, it's a good problem to have. Like, I, I guess I keep coming back to the fact that it's like, you know, you bring in Joey Votto. I, I find it so hard to believe that this guy, you know, could be in the minors for the Toronto Blue Jays, just considering, like, his entire track record and his career. But even if he is, and he is open to doing that, I mean, that's a great situation to be in. Yeah, my, my, my thoughts are almost like, uh, how long can you keep Joey Votto in the minors? Like, what That's if you true. bring up Daniel Vogelbach and he starts to do really well? Well, now you do you feel inclined to call up Joey Votto just because we all know it's Joey Votto. We love him. Yeah. Uh, what? What could that be a reality where we stash Joey Votto in AAA? It sounds crazy to say. I think once Votto's ready, there will somehow it's just going to work out. Somehow he'll he'll be in the major leagues. Um, mm. He looks really good. We all know he's a legend. Um, I just think he's going to get the chance to play himself off this team at the major league level. Now, he might not do that. He might show that he belongs on this team and end up having an 800 OPS or whatever the case. That would be an awesome story. But I think he gets the chance to play himself off it. And so that might mean, you know, because it, it gets clunky, right? You're right. You have Vogelback, you have Turner, you have Vladdy, you have potentially Votto. You have a lot of players that play maybe one, maybe two positions, they're getting older in a lot of cases. They don't offer a lot of speed. So it's not the ideal roster configuration. Maybe that means someone's on the IL. You know, it could be Turner, mm. pulls a hamstring, Vogelback, you know, has a has some shoulder soreness, whatever the case, right? You find ways to make it work. Um, more often than not, these things do resolve themselves. But I just think when Votto's ready, they're going to find a spot for him. I just, I mean, I keep coming back to the, the highlight that's playing in my brain right now which is Joey Votto on Canada Day, mashes one out of the park, oh. and all of MLB and Blue Jays fans are losing their mind. I just don't see a reality where the Toronto Blue Jays like don't allow that to happen, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I think they will give him that chance. And look, maybe he goes out there in April, 830 OPS, May, 870 OPS, June, 570 OPS. He's a part-time player. He's on the bench on Canada Day. He's released by July 15th, right? Like there are mm. all kinds of different scenarios out there. And by no means is it a guarantee that he has the kind of season um, that uh, that everyone would hope he would. But at the same time, as we get a little uh, cameo here, excuse me, guys. Yeah, I was but, say, um, uh, we got to give a little <laughs> shout out. We had, yeah. a, we, had a, we had Chad Dallas on uh, just a, a day or two ago. And he brought his animal in as well. Uh, Cutter, yeah. 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 Cutter, Cutter, the dog. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm in good company. I don't throw as hard as Chad Dallas, but uh, that's <laughs> that's good. So yeah, that's. Um, I, I think he'll get that chance. I think that we'll get the chance to see him, and and maybe it'll be an amazing story. Maybe he'll be released on May the 20th, right? But mm -hmm. I think I think we're going to see him in the majors. Yeah. Go One ahead. thing I I wanted to pick your brain about, I guess, cycling back to the Espinal thing, and this is something that that Adam and I were talking about off camera. Um, and it, it kind of surprised me a little bit that they did the Espinal move. And again, I, I think that Ernie Clement has earned himself a roster spot and, and all of that. And I want to see him on the team. He's played out of his skin this spring. But but are you concerned at all that he doesn't have any options? Like what happens if, uh, you, you know, Ernie Clement comes out and then in April, you know, what, what you're saying about Joey Votto, it's a, it's a 570 OPS for Ernie Clement. It's not really working for him. Like, what do you do then? DFA. Yeah, he's gone. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's fine. I, I think like at this point, you don't want to DFA him because he's played really well. There's a lot of promise there. Um, I, I really believe, based on the conversations I've had with other people in the industry, that he would get claimed if the Blue Jays tried to pass him through waivers mm -hmm. for good mm -hmm. reason. Um, so I don't think now is the time to try to do that. But end of the day, you're talking about someone who's a bench player, and so you know, you cannot get too attached to these guys in a season where the stakes are this high. Of course, like you're not going to overreact if Bo Bichette has a 570 OPS in, in April. But if Ernie Clement does and you really need that roster spot and you have someone else in the minor leagues who's, you know, it's a Leo Jimenez or it's an Orelvis Martinez even who's taking big strides and showing that they're a better option. At a certain point, you just got to be ready to make that change. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, uh, Ernie Clement, I've always, just from an outside watching, uh, he always felt like a good bench player. You know, playing playing a bench role and then playing an everyday role is completely different, as you know. Um, it almost feels like Ernie has gotten used to that. Obviously, last year coming up with the Jays and, and showing it this year where he, he's fresh off the bench and he still can put up a good at bat, you know, get you a couple hits a game if you really need to and maybe swipe a bag like have you had conversations with him at all of, of how he prepares and how he gets ready to that for that kind of role? 
You know, I haven't dived in deep with him on that topic, but he certainly seems to pull it off. And yeah. that's really important, right? Like on a team where you have Bo Bichette at shortstop, you're not really going to have a lot of starts available at short. But mm -hmm. as we saw last year, when Bo was, was sidelined, then they could turn to Ernie Clement. He could handle the position, bring some nice speed off the bench, as you mentioned. And he's also able to offer a little versatility where he can play some second or some third or some left field. So it's a good bench player to have. And just because he can put the bat on the ball, that's a good start. And they're actually seeing some power from him this spring. So mm -hmm. I actually think like, you know, this is a guy that if you're looking for kind of sleeper candidates on this team to, you know, maybe get some run with the third base job, or maybe he takes over a second base, like it could happen. And again, there's a wide range of possibilities here. Maybe he's, he's DFA or maybe he goes out there and he hits 275 for a full season with the 750 OPS. And everyone's like, whoa, this guy is a real contributor on this team. Speaking of, uh, speaking of the infield, man, uh, like, I mean, you put it perfectly. Bo Bichette is obviously the locked in shortstop and Guerrero is obviously the locked in first baseman, but then you got the second base bag and you got the third base bag. And, you know, kind of a conversation all of spring and, I mean, all off season really is like, who is going to be taking the reps there? What does that split look like? They go out, they pay IKF $15 million, probably a bit too much if you ask me, but that's another topic. Anyways, they go out, they get him. What is the, uh, what does those positions look like to you? Who's taking the majority of the reps? Um, what's the split? Yeah, for now, I think IKF gets the chance to run with that everyday third base job. And mm -hmm. we'll see how he does with it. You know, defensively, probably fair to expect some really good uh, glove work at third base. Offensively, this is not a guy who has hit much in the major leagues over the course of a long period of time. So you're expecting a below average offensive player with the bat. Um, and you can live with that if his defense is good enough and he's batting eight. So that's what I would expect a third base to start the season. And then once you get into the second base mix, I think it's Kevin Biggio against most right-handed pitchers um, mm -hmm. and against left-handed pitchers. I mean, there is an opportunity there for an Ernie Clement or a Davis Schneider. And we don't know exactly how the bench is going to fit together. Uh, Davis Schneider is someone who certainly could be used in that role. Or if Biggio plays well enough, maybe he faces some lefties. I mean, stranger things have happened, but I think at least against the right-handed pitchers, it'd be Biggio in there to start. Yeah, I think it's a great problem to have. I mean, the competition can be great when used in the right way, you know, to motivate everybody to be on their best game for every single off-bat. And that's something I actually want to talk about because we obviously know the offense is a big topic of discussion, especially after last season. Uh, they get Donnie Baseball taking over as offensive coordinator. I want to pick your brain a little bit while we have you on here. And what is the... What is the word around uh, camp with these hitters? Because they've been doing really well so far this spring. Has there been an overall kind of new approach or is it individual, like doing their own separate uh, adjustments or that they're, that they're making in this offseason? Like what have you kind of heard around the camp of what the Blue Jays are trying to accomplish at the dish? Yeah, my read from being down there and talking to a lot of the folks involved on the hitting side is that it really is highly individualized. And I think just, you know, having the chance to – you know, covered Don Mattingly a little bit last year as he was, uh, you know, first joining the Blue Jays. He's not like this authoritarian who's going to go in there and say, all right, guys, like I'm the offensive coordinator. We're all out there trying to hit three run homers every pitch right now. Like right. for some guys, that's going to be the approach. For other guys, they're going to want to take it to the opposite field or they're going to want to hit it, you know, into the gaps. And if that's what works for those guys, I don't see Don Mattingly trying to overhaul it and trying to be this, um, you know, really domineering presence. So uh, I think it's up to the individual players. And what we've seen from those guys so far is honestly pretty promising. Like Dalton Varsha looked great down there. Vlad Jr. looked pretty good. Kirk seems to be in a good spot offensively with his swing. Even Springer. I mean, Turner is healthy. That's what you want from him at age 39 at this point in his career, coming through spring healthy and hitting line drives. So you know, obviously you have Bo. They're they're in a good spot. I actually think that offensively this team should be able to score some runs and bounce back from where they were last year. That's yeah. I mean that's great to hear because the next question I was going to ask is what is your your expectation for this offense? But I mean you kind of answered it there, and I I just I got to agree with you. Like watching these spring training at bats, and I know people are going to come and they're going to say, "Oh, spring training stats don't matter," which is you know true to an extent. But I mean 
Vladimir Guerrero Jr. belted one for 113 miles per hour off the bat. You know, you, like that's a real thing that's happening right now. You know, Bo Bichette is is up there in the league lead in Grapefruit League for the most hard hit baseballs. That's a real thing mm -hmm. that's going on right now. And of course, they're all hitting for like a one OPS yeah. right now. I, maybe I'm that guy where it's I'm overreacting to spring training stats, but it almost feels like, and especially with some of the injuries uh, that walking into the season. I almost feel better about this offense right now than I do the pitching rotation. Is that crazy to say? Oh, I mean, I think by far. I think their offense is in a is in a really good spot, and I think their pitching is not in a really good spot. <laughs> so, yeah, when I look at that contrast, it's kind of funny just given the way last year played out and how different it looks to be this year. But, yeah, I, I think that the, the pitching staff has some real, real questions. You know, Bowden Francis – Great story. I think he's ready. Um, I think he's mm -hmm. going to be pretty good as a number four, but who knows, right? He hasn't done it. Like, there's still questions there. You can't just say he's going to be an automatic, you know, 4.25 ERA for 125 mm -hmm. innings. Like, that'd be great, but I just, I don't think it's that simple. So he's a question mark. And then obviously with the number five spot, that's a question mark too. So, you know, as long as Gosman looks like he'll probably miss a start or two that's not the end of the world but it's also not ideal and Manoa's you know timeline is is very uncertain right now uh seemingly at least a month away from being able to contribute as a fully stretched out major league starting pitcher so you have real real questions there and that to me is not to mention the bullpen so that to me is mm -hmm. where the real uncertainty lies with this team yeah, that's actually something I wanted to ask is where where are the Blue Jays going to look to? Because obviously no 4-5, like real solid 4-5. Obviously, we love Bowden. We're, we love him on the show here too. Uh, but maybe maybe he doesn't give you the innings like you're saying. Listen, give you – he could go five, right? Can he give you six, seven? We don't – we haven't seen that, right? Uh, and then obviously the whole Trevor Richards and then Mitch White coming in after, uh, you know, after the open uh, once after lineup, that's going to start eating away at the bullpen. So – and considering the injuries to Romano and you've got, um, um, oh my gosh, uh, Eric Swanson, thank Swanson. you, Eric, Eric Swanson, uh, who, who are the Blue Jays going to be looking to to kind of eat some innings here in that bullpen? It's going to be a lot of different guys. I think that you're going to see, you know, John Schneider's probably going to use the, the phrase all hands on deck, and it's mm. probably a pretty accurate one. Like we will see a lot of Trevor Richards, probably as you're saying, maybe paired with a, a Mitch White. And then it's like, if one of Romano or Swanson needs to start the season on the injured list, maybe that is a pathway for Nate Pearson or Zach Pop or Brennan Little or two or the above to break camp with this team. And then all of a sudden you're like down one at the trop and here comes Brennan Little and everyone's like, what, who's this guy? You know, and he's, he's a pretty, you know, interesting enough pitcher, yeah. potential yeah. third lefty, but yeah, like that's, that's how it could look. And it could look like that pretty quick. So the Jays have to be prepared to tap into that depth with their pitching because it's just not going to be plan A to start the season. Uh, I was doing some like cherry picking stats because obviously we have Tampa Bay and Houston to begin the Toronto Blue Jays season. Seven games total there. And you're going to have Jose Barrios and you're going to have uh, Chris Bassett. They're going to go twice against those teams. The good thing is in the two starts they both had against both those teams last year, they had an ERA below three. And they both went, I think, 13 and 12 innings each. So uh, there will be some longevity or length there given by them. But then, of course, you do got to consider those other three starts. How much are we going to get out of those guys, right? Yeah. No, it's uh, it's a tough one. And and like you say, those opponents are, are really tough too, right? The Rays, mm -hmm. the Astros, the Yankees. We all know it's a tough start out of the gate. You've got three road trips or three road cities before you even get home. But look, that's the challenge, right? Like you want to win in this league, you've got to beat the good teams. You can't just beat up on the Pirates and the White Sox. You have to beat up on some of the best teams. If you have a vision of actually accomplishing your goals and not just being like this fringe wildcard team, well, the way to do that is to win a lot of games and win them early and win them with some unheralded contributors. So it's going to be really tough, right? The Jays are not the best team in this division on paper. Um, it's not an easy challenge to get through the grind of 162. Uh, even when you are fully healthy, and they're not. So they're going to need some guys to really step up and kind of come out of nowhere maybe in ways that they haven't in years past. They're going to need some development success stories, and that's going to be the pathway for them to surprise because it wasn't the A-plus offseason. I think that's probably saying it pretty mildly. So they're going to need some internal answers to come up.
Listen, you're talking about the A plus offseason. We were uh, we were live streaming for about eight hours watching his goddamn plane that he was never on. You know who we're talking about. In fact, yeah, we were watching the Dragons Den live oh, yeah. in Toronto oh, yeah. for uh, for about eight hours. So we know all about the offseason. <laughs> oh yeah, believe me, I I will not forget that day anytime soon. Uh, we're, okay, gotta ask you: Were you tracking it at any point, or maybe click on it, click on the link, see if he was on of there? Of course, <laughs> I would not be doing my job if I wasn't. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, speaking of, uh, you were bringing up like uh, a lot of guys that unite um, breakout players. Effectively, like we're gonna need some performances from some dudes that we just we're not necessarily thinking about right now. Who is Ben Nicholson Smith? Crush. For this year, you know, who are you looking at and thinking, okay, like this guy, this guy for me, it, he's ready to take it and uh, to use the, the former slogan to the next level. Whoa, time for your daily Betway breather. A quick reminder that the best place to bet is on Betway. Must be 19 years of age or older to play in collaboration with iGaming Ontario. Please bet responsibly. Now, back to the content. There we go. Yeah, I, honestly, I would say it's Bowden Francis. Like, I don't think that it's a guarantee. So to phrase it that way would not be fair to anyone. But yeah, I think that if you're looking at someone who can kind of jump from being a 36 inning contributor last year to he could do three times as much this year. He might do 120 innings or 125 innings. And I really think he can hold his own and mix his pitches and just throw enough strikes that he gets results. So that's my prediction right now. Um, you know, we'll see. The Jays definitely need it, though, because if he doesn't come through, then, you know, you don't want to have to go too far down that line and have Paolo Espino. You know, it's a great story. All due respect to Paolo Espino. But, you know, you don't want him starting every five days. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I wanted to also get uh, get your thoughts on Varsho really quick because I've been I've been vouching for this guy ever since the first game. We went three for three. I was really fighting for this guy. Uh, I change in the swing, open stance, uh, mentally changing, it, and when you see him take a hack at the plate, it, it, it really does look a lot different this year. Um, can you confirm that? Like he he's trying his best to stay consistent, and in, in, he's not going to kind of wait for it. Like what's what's kind of the word on Dalton Varsho right now? Yeah, looking really good. Um, great approach. The numbers in spring are really good. He just seems really comfortable, relaxed. Um, you know, he said that he was getting under the ball too much last year, maybe trying to launch it up uh, into the air a little bit too hard. Um, it seems like the approach now will be a little bit more, hey, get back to that line drive swing, just swing through the ball. And if he's able to do that, then, you know, his speed plays. Um, he's just, you know, he's someone who does a lot of things right. And mm -hmm. we all know about the defense. We all know now about what he's able to do um, with that power when he does connect. But I think, too, if he can add a few more doubles and singles and just some more of that line drive approach, then you're looking at a complete player and someone who, you know, can once again be a really important part of this team. Yeah. yeah and, well, I, I mean, if he can put all that together, like, it just blows me away how defensively sound he is and just how much war he racks up there in the field, right? Like, if he actually does put together even just a slightly above average season with the bat. Like, yeah, like a 105 plus, you know, OPS. Yeah, yeah like, you know, this could be a, a six and a half war player like yeah. that. You know, and it's like, oh my God, like we're now almost in the MVP conversation, <laughs> right? Yeah. No, it's, it's honestly, it's true, guys, because, you know, you think about how few players offer his defensive impact. And if you look at the, the metrics for the last couple of years, like he is literally second to none, according mm -hmm. to some of the metrics on Baseball Savant. So, you know, that is, that is huge. The run prevention is a big part of this, a big part of this game. And he's clearly capable of excelling in that department. So yeah, I, I think his ceiling is like a six win player and that's pretty wild. Not a lot of guys have that, right? Vladdy yeah. does, Bo does. At this point, Springer doesn't, you know, it's a, it's, yeah. it's tough to, to have that kind of ceiling. And I think Varsho has it. Actually, just before we, we let you go, you brought up Springer there. Are we are we thinking that the bounce back is coming here? I mean, I know a lot of people were kind of disappointed with with what we got from him last year, and he's more than capable of being one of the better outfielders in the MLB. But but what can we realistically expect from him, twenty twenty four? It's it's hard to know, right? I think that um, you know the Jays now are halfway through this contract, one hundred fifty million dollar contract, biggest contract in the history of the franchise. You would have hoped, if you were the Blue Jays, that Springer would have delivered a huge amount of value in the first half of that contract. Yeah. yeah. That he might have had a 35 homer season or a big home run in the playoffs or, 
He might have led this team down the stretch to to some great heights. And it just hasn't happened. That's what they paid for. It hasn't happened. So mm. can it happen? Yeah, it can. Um, we'll see, right? We'll see if it if it can happen. Um, he's certainly a very accomplished player who did a lot of really great things with the Houston Astros and was a hugely important part of what the Houston Astros accomplished. Um, at this point, the Jays just haven't accomplished anything with Springer. So that's a part of his legacy here in Toronto that's missing, as it is for a lot of players on this team. Um, Because collectively, they have not accomplished anything as a group. Mm -hmm. Well, 2024 is going to be different, all right? Big accomplishments on the way. (laughs) Book it, folks. Uh, L.A. Dodgers, Toronto Blue Jays World Series. Blue Jays get their revenge for the playing live stream. Strikes out Otani for the final. Bowden Bowden Francis. Bowden Francis. Show Otani. That's the highlight. (laughs) Wow. Okay, I like that call, guys. I like that call. If if that happens, then... uh, Someone's going to have to put a tracker on the Blue Jays jet going to Los Angeles for the, for the back half <laughs> yeah. of the World Series. <laughs> Dude, uh, it has been such a pleasure having you on, uh, just talking some ball, man. We thoroughly appreciate it. Uh, we'll be keeping up with everything that you're writing, everything that you're doing uh, all throughout the season. And for all the listeners out there, I mean, we don't even need to say this right now, but go check out Ben Nicholson Smith's stuff. It's always phenomenal. Well, I appreciate that, guys. It's my pleasure. Uh, good luck with the show, continued success, and thanks so much for having me on. Thank Thanks. you, Ben. Well, there you have it, folks. There is Ben Nicholson Smith, kind of a breakdown as to what's been going on recently, the Espinal trade, and then what we can look for this upcoming season. Bowden Francis, I am on the goddamn hype train. Mm. Nobody can take me off. Absolutely. Guys, let us know your thoughts in the comments down below about everything that we talked about. $3 a month to become a Patreon member. And shout out and thank you to all of our current Patreon members and to our YouTube members as well. You guys are fantastic. Thank you so much for watching. And go, Chase, go! go.